are you signing something that looks like a form? Does it obligate you to do something? Does it take some of your rights away? Does it take some of your freedom away? Does it give something of yours, money, power, or rights to someone or something else? You may be signing a type of contract where you consent to have some of your rights taken from you and given to someone else. Are you then given the right to take those rights back or to end the contract? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Federalism is defined in Executive Order 13132 where it says acts of the national government, whether legislative, executive, or judicial in nature that exceed the enumerated powers of that government under the constitution violate the principle of federalism established by the framers. So when the federal government does something such as create certain forms, when it complies with federalism, it is said yes to comply with federalism. When it does not comply with federalism, it says no, it does not comply with federalism. Every form has to be approved through an approval process. That approval process Part of that is that it has to state whether or not that form complies with the Constitution, which is federalism, or it does not comply with the Constitution, meaning federalism, no. We'll see some examples here in a second. So here is a manual that I have gone over in several of my videos. And within this manual, you can um, read and understand that the federal government, according to the Constitution, depending on what you believe the Constitution says, if you read it under the old beliefs or the propagandized beliefs, you, you believe that the Constitution is over all the states and all the people everywhere all the time. But within these reports put out by the federal government, they explain that the Constitution applies only on the federal lands and to the people on those federal lands. Now, the states did agree not to interfere with the federal government has going on on those federal lands. And those are shown in the session laws and the fact that the states, at least most of them or all of them except Texas, did not sell land to the federal government and reserved the right over some of those lands for a lot of purposes. So what happened was when a state joined the union, the people of that state remained under their original form of government. So for Texas, it was the Republic of Texas, but for some other states, it was their original form of government. Now they had some lands in their state that they donated to the federal government for those military purposes. And all those purposes are listed in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. And those purposes are um, limited to the lands that they gave to the federal government or sold to the federal government or leased to the federal government. So in order to allow the federal government to make those laws on those lands, they not only sold the land, but they ceded jurisdiction. Now, some states um, kept some jurisdiction over those federal lands for themselves, like the right to serve process upon a person who comes off the federal lands, commits a crime, and then goes back to the federal lands. And all of this is very well explained in many of the documents that the federal government has put out. So because the federal government has no authority off the federal lands, what they did, in my opinion, was they created all these instrumentalities who are quasi-public-private, and so they are making contracts with the people who are not under federal authority in order to make them things like taxpayers in order to make them believe that they have to get a license through their legal state. And their legal state is is the federal lands all combined inside of one state called state of, for example, Texas. So state of Texas are all the federal lands in Texas. Texas is the territory which encompasses all the people. And the Republic of Texas is supposed to be the government for the people of Texas who are not on the federal lands. Now we go down, you can uh, download this book off of archive.org. I've made sure that this book is on there. So if you can't find it, just uh, text me in the comments and um, I'll go and look and make sure it's there. It should be there though. And then they have the key to states and so on and such and such. And then they have this document. You need to read this document and understand. This is the legislative jurisdiction that the federal government has over the federal lands inside the states. So at the seat of government, where it says in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, 
over the seat of government, the federal government has exclusive legislative jurisdiction, meaning they have all lawmaking power. Nobody can interfere with that. But in some of the states, they don't have complete jurisdiction. They don't have exclusive jurisdiction. This is why in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, the particular states that gave lands or sold lands to the federal government, some of them retained some of their rights over those federal lands. And so these are concurrent jurisdictions, partial legislative jurisdiction, proprietorial interest only, proprietorial interest shows that the federal government um, has only um, purchasing right over those lands. And then they have an unknown, um, I don't know what that is for certain, and I don't think the government does either because they called it unknown. Now you have state statutes, you have uh, session laws, and session laws were when the, federal, when the state ceded lawmaking authority over those lands to the federal government. So they not only gave the lands, but then they had to cede the rights to the land, the rights to have the government make laws for those lands. And some states ceded all rights, some states ceded some rights, some states kept their rights. And you see in here that Texas is a special state because of um, its right to secede from the union. Okay, so uh, this is my copy that has my notes and stuff in it, but um, the copy that I downloaded onto archive.org has, I think none of this um, markings in it. But you really should go and download this book and look through it. It's only about, I don't know, really about 20 pages that are worth reading. And some of these pages are forms. And these forms are at one point in time, I believe it was under the Eisenhower administration, he put down a, a law or, or an executive order that required the government or the GSA, the General Services Administration, to go through and um, count all of the lands that they owned and what kind of jurisdiction they had over those lands. Now, I have gone and I've asked for these reports, these copies of these forms, and nobody seems to have them. I can't not find them anywhere. Um, someone did find some in a library, I think, in their state, which is not my state. Um, and they sent them to me and, it, and they're, they're, they are out there. Uh, they're hard to come by, though. They may be in the state archives of your state. OK, so you can go and find this at archive.org. We see in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, that the right of the federal government to purchase lands for forts is expressed in the law as to how the federal government is going to go about doing this. Public Laws, Chapter 389, July 30th, 1947, 61 Step 644, Assent to Purchase Lands for Forts, Section 103. The President of the United States is authorized to procure to the assent of the legislator of any state within which any purchase of land has been made for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings without such consent having been obtained. We know that the United States, being the federal government, created federal states within the limits of particular states. These federal states are the federal lands, which by the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, are the seat of government and places purchased. There must have been a session of jurisdiction called session laws. The state that donated or sold the land to the federal government for the erection of the forts had to also cede lawmaking power over those places. The states did not cede lawmaking power over the entire state. They only ceded lawmaking power over those places that were sold or donated to the federal government for the erection of their forts or the creation of their seat of government. In United States versus 1 Woodbury and Minot, page 76, it states, quote, where the United States, being the federal government, own land situated within the limits of particular states and over which they have no session of jurisdiction for objects either special or general, little doubt exists that the rights and remedies in relation to it are usually the same as apply to other landholders within the states.
Here is an example of a form from the Treasury Department or IRS Department. It says here, government levels affected, none, federalism, no, which means it doesn't affect any levels of, of government and it does not comply with the constitution, meaning federalism, no, it does not comply with the ideas of federalism defined in executive order 13132. Here is another approval process documented for a federal form from HHS and CMS. And this says government levels affected, local and state. Federalism, no. So this appears to be something that is a contract outside of the constitution between local state governments and the federal government does not comply with the constitution. Our next form is DHS slash OS. This is the approval process for a form that they're using. And it says down here, government levels affected federal. Federalism, no. So this is a form that affects the federal government. It's for use at the federal level, but it does not comply with the ideas of, con of the constitution. Therefore, federalism is no, because it does not comply with executive order 13132 defined federalism as uh, in compliance with the constitution. So it's a voluntary form, probably a contract of some sort, used among the federal people on the federal lands, but not in compliance with the Constitution. Now look at, uh, let's look at this USDA FSA form. It's signature authority. So this to me looks like a contract. Abstract, if an individual will sign documents in a representative capacity, that sounds like a contract to me. So the federal government is offering through their instrumentality, a contract to people that once they sign it, it goes on file in the county office, and then the federal government will use its authority against those people because they signed a contract. Most of what the federal government does when it doesn't comply with the ideas of, cons of the Constitution, and it's uh, given to private people in their private capacity to do business with the government, the government acts as if this is a requirement for people to do, but it's only a requirement if you want to do it. If you want to do it, then it is a requirement to follow the laws of the contract. If you choose not to sign the contract, then of course you receive no benefits, which they call benefits, which really these days aren't benefits. They just take your money and they give it to someone else and then they call that a benefit. But here it says, if you'll sign the documents, FSA requires supporting documentation to be on file in the county office authorizing that capacity. Recent audits of field office operations revealed that this supporting documentation was, in many instances, not on file in the county office. However, further reviews discovered that in most of these cases, an authorized individual had in fact signed program documents. The program benefits were dispersed in correct amounts and the correct people received the benefits. So it's a contract with benefits, rights, obligations, and benefits. So you have rights, the government has rights. You have obligations, the government have, has obligations, and you have benefits, and the government has benefits. It's just a contract. They call it a license, they call it a permit, they call it all kinds of things, but it's really just a contract. And we know it's a contract because it affects no government levels, as we see down here, government levels affected none. And we also see that it does not comply with the ideas of federalism. Code.house.gov and the various titles. And we see some titles have an asterisk and some titles don't. The titles without an asterisk uh, are not in compliance with the ideas of federalism. And this is said to be uh, not a positive law. So when uh, the title complies with the ideas of federalism, when they're constitutional, they have a positive law citation. When they don't comply with the constitution, they don't have a positive law citation. Okay, so you should. Take the time to go to this website and look through the various titles that do not comply with the ideas of federalism. You can easily spot them because they do not have an asterisk next to the um, title title of the title shown here. Uh, a law or a title has a positive law citation. The reason we need to know is because we need to know whether or not this is a constitutional law or an offer to make a contract with us. If it is an offer to make a contract with us, it does not have a positive law citation. It does not comply with the ideas of federalism, which means it is a choice. You sign because you want to sign and you agree to follow the laws and receive the benefits. But the courts need to know also. And so when the positive law citation is shown or the title is cited as a positive law, as a federal law, it looks a certain way. And when the courts see that, they know that this is a federal law, who it applies to and where it applies to. When it does not have that, the courts see right away that this is a contract. And so it depends whether or not 
the, the court is going to use federal law or constitutional law or contract law. Does it bother you that we have no social contract? <laughs> my whole life is one big compromise. I tiptoe around everyone like they're made of China. I spend all my time analyzing what will the effect be if I say this. Then there's you. You're a reality junkie. If I offered you a comforting lie, you'd smack me over the head with it. Let's not change that. Okay. No, see, this... If you were implementing the social contract, you'd say that, but only because it makes me feel better. It's kind of fun watching you torture yourself. Do you think things will work out with my brother? No. When it does go wrong, it won't be your fault. If I want to get the vaccine, I get to choose. So you can't force, if, if I can't force you to get an abortion, you shouldn't be able to force because me to get Because it's the, not about you. It's about people you interact with, and that's the social contract of public but we health. Don't, we don't even know if the vaccine... From Penn Law, and this is on the social contract theory. Okay, now we're talking about the courts and social contracts. So I've been going through these uh, various forms and laws and such, and the point is to help you understand that many of the things that you sign that you believe are federal forms that you're required to sign are not really um, law for you to sign them. They're not required. They're forms and they're offered to you as a contract. No one is forced to contract with anyone. No one is forced to sign a form. Okay. No one is forced to do business with anyone they don't want to do business with. When you sign the IRS forms, you are agreeing to do business with the IRS outside the Constitution as a form of a social contract. It only becomes a law and you're only obligated after you sign the contract, just as you would sign a contract for a mortgage or to pay back a loan for a vehicle or to pay your credit card debt or any other thing. So in the introduction, the writer talks about the concept of contract is a union of the ideas of agreement and obligation. Social contract theories seek to legitimate civil authority by appealing to notions of rational agreement. These diverse theories of morality, politics, and law posit actual or hypothetical circumstances of pre-regulated society termed the state of nature in early, early modern social contract theories and the original position in John Rawls theory, social contract theories provide that rational individuals will agree by contract, compact, or covenant to give up the condition of unregulated freedom in exchange for the security of a civil society governed by a just binding rule of law. So this is where usually people bring up to me the idea that taxes are in the constitution and therefore people, all people are required to pay a federal tax. And my position is that that's not actually true. And that's shown in the fact that title 26 has no positive law citation. Title 26 forms are not considered federalistic, meaning they don't comply with the ideas of the Constitution as defined in Executive Order 13132, signed by Bill Clinton, which um, so far as maybe a year ago, it had not been repealed. So proper taxation is done through the federal government and applied to the states and the people on the federal land. When I say the states, I do not mean the people of the states. I mean the legal state and the legal state is basically the um, federal states. It may also be the independent states uh, that's yet to be figured out on my part. But federal taxes here in uh, um, Title IV U.S. Code 105 state and so forth, taxation affecting federal areas, sales and use tax, you can look this up if you like. If you go to the Constitution, you see that the United States, which is the federal people, the federal lands or the seat of government, federal only, 
um, is allowed, the Congress of the United States is allowed to make laws for the United States. They're allowed to legislate. So they're allowed to bring forth their law of their land, which is the Constitution. And further, it states in Article 1, Section 8, the things that the list of things, very specific list of things that Congress is allowed to do on the federal lands. And we see the federal lands shown in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 as the seat of government and places purchased. So the federal government then is allowed to tax the federal people on the federal lands um, in the states and the seat of government, the people at the seat of government. This would be basically the military. They can um, tax some of the military's uh, income. I've gone into that extensively. I've used the officer's manuals um, that I have found from the 1800s that show exactly what is taxed and the impost and the excise and so on and so forth. And that's because the federal government treats its military industrial complex or its military back when the Constitution was written as a corporation with employees, meaning that they had the same rights and benefits as some people would who work for their employers, such as the right to their um, copyrights and patents, which if you were to work for an employer and you made a discovery working in a facility owned by the employer while receiving um, employee pay, then you would have the right to your uh, patents for a period of time and then the company would own it after that. So the same goes for, according to the military officer's manuals from the 1800s, the same goes for the military members on the federal lands who make discoveries or inventions, that they have a right to the uh, profits from those for a period of time. And then after that, the um, ownership of those things are um, handed over to the federal government. So tax, impost, excise, and all those things listed in Article 1, Section 8 are for the federal people on the federal lands and are the things that the Congress of the United States, not the United States of America, are supposed to legislate for um, those people. So they're supposed to make the laws that carry out the things in the Constitution. And this is further clarified in some of the definitions on contract law. So before I move on to explaining contracts and the various definitions and sort of some minutia of this topic, I want to go back to this um, approval process for a form used by the USDA slash FSA. And I want to draw your attention to under abstract, the very last sentence that they put in here. Okay, so I hope that you can see this. Um, it says, we will add a certification statement to all forms requiring a producer's signature. So it's talking about the USDA, the producer's signature, um, the producer of the form. I think they're talking about the person who created the form that they'll certify a statement on all the forms. Okay, similar to what the Internal Revenue Service uses on many of their forms, okay? And their forms are contracts. So let's take a look at that. Trust government definitions because what they call a definition is not really a definition. So this is 15 USC 44, and I brought this up to show you particularly um, what they say on contracts that are forms. But um, among the definitions we see Commerce means commerce. So this is exactly not what a definition is. Commerce means commerce is basically the substantial part of the definition. Everything else is who the commerce is between or among, among the several states or with foreign nations or any territory, the United States or in the District of Columbia or between any such territory in another or between any such territory in any state or for a nation, or between the District of Columbia and any state or territory, or for a nation. So where is the de definition of commerce? Okay, there's no um, definition of commerce. It just says commerce means commerce, and then who the commerce is in between or among. So keeping in mind that definitions sometimes are not defined, or words are not actually defined in the definition, for example, um, the definition we just saw for commerce 
was commerce and then who commerce is in between or among, which is not a definition of commerce at all. But I'm still going to look at um, form contract. This is from 15 United States Code subsection 45 BA3. And it says uh, form contract, the general, in general, except as provided in subparagraph B, the term form contract means a contract with standard terms used by a person in the course of selling or leasing the person's goods or services. Um, and a good, I suppose, would be the use of a paper Federal Reserve debt note um, that you could then call income. And when you're using someone else's property, they have a right to tax it, or you're sort of renting or leasing it, just as from ancient Rome, where it said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, they were talking about when Caesar would lend land to poor people to make them productive citizens, but in turn, they were taxed a portion of their yield. So that was their lease or their rent for the public lands that they were using to produce. And then part of whatever they produced they owed a portion of that back to Caesar or back to the empire, and that was called tax. Okay, so these form contracts are standard contracts, which they don't give you any negotiation power to them. So most forms that you sign, um, sort of individual forms that are created for a sole purpose of doing a transaction between two people, you can take the form and mark things out and add things to it and you're negotiating back and forth. And so they look out at the person who offers you the form. You can mark out whatever you want. You can add whatever you want. You can change numbers and then you give it back. And then they go through it and they retype it or they say, no, we don't agree to this change or that change. We agree to the other changes. They retype it, they give it back to you. And then of course you could um, mark things out again, sort of like um, a prenuptial agreement. This is how you would do it. Or an actor who is trying to negotiate his salary and any other um, monetary gain he would receive from uh, making a movie with a company, the company or the management company or whoever would offer the actor the contract and the, the actor would have some negotiation power and he could mark things out, add things to it and give it back. And then the company would mark things out and add things to it and give it back. And so that's the negotiation of a contract, but in these form contracts, such as, for example, the IRS form, you have no negotiation power. It is what it is. It's the standard contract. Every single judge, lawyer, attorney, and likely most politicians or anyone in business would know what a standard form contract is. Real estate agents use standard form contracts for the most part. There is some negotiations on some parts of the contract, and then other parts of the contract are basically standard forms. And so um, they all know what these standard forms are. The IRS form to me looks like a standard form that is approved through the regulatory information office as a form to be used by its instrumentalities when its instrumentalities then use these forms to um, make contracts with private people. Okay, then it's a private contract using a standard form between the instrumentality, such as the Federal Reserve Bank or the IRS, and an individual person. And when the individual person signs it, the individual person makes it a law or obligation between the two of them. Sign it. Are you signing something that looks like a form? Does it obligate you to do something? Does it take some of your rights away? Does it take some of your freedom away? Does it give something of yours, money, power, or rights to someone or something else? You may be signing a type of contract where you consent to have some of your rights taken from you and given to someone else. 
Are you then given the right to take those rights back or to end the contract? 